Welcome. Uh, so welcome to our session, uh, Mapping the Change We Want, Geocoded Statistics to Track SDG 16 Indicators. Um, we're very excited to be uh, co-hosting this. We're the Global Registry of Violent Deaths, Grieved, um, and uh, we have a number of our consortium members here, and we're working with GeoCensus on this uh, and to deliver this session. We're very excited uh, to have this conversation about uh, SDG 16 and how it can be monitored and tracked uh, better with geocoded data and statistics. Uh, and we see a number of sessions that are happening during the UN World Data Forum, including one yesterday on the, uh, a global convention for a registry of uh, geocoding um, that we're very excited about. And I really like the direction that this is going. And we hope we make the case to you uh, in the next hour and 15 minutes that uh, it's absolutely vital and essential that uh, the data that is being produced uh, for monitoring SDG 16 has to be geocoded wherever it can and temporarily coded whenever it can. We think that this is we've we've determined this in the course of our grieved research, but also uh, with a with a number of other people working on related uh, issues. We'll talk about some of them today, um, but we think this is vital and important. So we're going to try to make a compelling case to you. Uh, we have. Uh, four speakers with us today, um, and uh, unfortunately, one of our speakers had to drop out. So uh, Magnus Oberg from the Uppsala Conflict Data Program couldn't join us, uh, but we'll try to do uh, his two slides justice, um, and we encourage you to follow up with with, uh, with us any with any questions, and we can can, can convey them to him as well. Uh, but it was a family emergency, and we all understand, of course, that he wasn't able to make it. Um, before we go into the, the discussion proper, we also are very happy to have an intervention uh, from Rolando Ocampo. He is the director of the statistic division at ECLAC, and he was very much looking forward to being in this session, uh, but we then went ahead and scheduled this session at the exact same time that he's in another session uh, where he's talking about geospatial COVID data. So he's, um, he's done the impossible and he will join us here at the same time that he's in that other session uh, by pre-recording. So I'm going to uh, just go ahead and get us started uh, with a brief intervention from Rolando Ocampo, um, just to a, kind of an overview of some of the issues we're, we're facing and the need and the priority of, of geospatial coding of this data. Um, so I'll share screen now and we'll go into the, the video. And then when we come out of that, we'll jump right into a um, presentation by N. Severin uh, from the Small Arms Survey. And I'll introduce each of the speakers uh, as, we, as we go. Good day to everyone. And thank you very much to the forum and the session organizers for having invited us to share some thoughts on the integration of statistical and special information to open the discussion in this session regarding the challenges of collecting geocoded data to monitor SDG 16. To provide a global context, the Statistical Commission of the United Nations and the Global Geospatial Information Management, UNGGIM, has endorsed the Global Statistical Geospatial Framework, which provides a common geocoding methodology for integrating a range of statistical and administrative data. There are several uh, valuable benefits from the implementation of this global framework, which open a spot of collaboration and coordination of the statistical and geospatial communities at different levels, from global to national, such as supporting the measuring and monitoring of the targets on the global indicator framework for the 2030 Agenda of Sustainable Development Goals and the 2020 Round of Population and Housing Census. Unlocking of new insights and data relationships that will not have been possible by analyzing socioeconomic, environmental, or geospatial data in isolation. Comparisons at local, subnational, national, regional, and global levels for decision-making processes within and between countries and thematic domains. Increased information on the smaller geographical areas. Increased awareness of methods and tools to assess and manage disclosure risk to enhance privacy in collection, storage, and dissemination of information. The value of your coding is concretizing at event of data. Proper coding says, this event happened here at this time, which is important for abstract concepts like peace and justice. 
Integration of new sources of data to inform the production of high quality geospatial information, for example, earth observations and other complementary data resources. The global framework relies on five principles that consist of fundamental geospatial infrastructures and geocoding, geocoded unit record data in data management environment, common geographies for dissemination of statistics, statistical and geospatial interoperability, and accessible and usable geospatial enabled statistics. The main topic of this session is focused on several of these principles that are related to the adoption of a common and consistent approach to place each statistical unit of a data phase in time and space using fundamental geospatial infrastructure for geocoding processes. Of high relevance, here is the availability of high quality and standardized locations to assign accurate coordinate small geographic areas or standard grid reference to each statistical unit at the microdata or unit record level. In addition, time and date stamping this location clearly plays the unit both in time and space due to the strong statistical requirement for establishing data in a time series. In order to implement the first principle of the GSGF, the process of obtaining location and geocodes should use as input your reference address, building register, land parcels, and or place name as part of the statistical geospatial infrastructure. If such register is not available, any point-based alternatives should be used. A wide range of key stakeholders can contribute to the implementation of this principle, including national statistical offices with their corresponding national statistical system, the national geospatial information agencies involving geospatial data infrastructure, non-governmental organizations, civil society, private enterprise, data suppliers, and citizens, all of them in an open data environment. All these stakeholders are going to face the challenges related with geocoding statistical data on peace and justice. For example, the location of time coding of violent deaths is a key element for to monitoring the target 16.1. During the session, we will explore the issues regarding the possibilities of alternative data sources and associated data disaggregation methodologies uh, to conduct geocoding and fundamental geospatial data sets available to support these processes, mostly coming from non-traditional sources like crowdsourcing and satellite management. Lastly, I would like to take this opportunity to mention that the analysis of the geospatial support to the production of the SDGs indicators is a priority for UNGGIJ. In fact, the working group of geospatial information in the interagency expert group of the Sustainable Development Goals has been working in a definition of a short list of indicators where geospatial information can contribute directly or indirectly. Up to date, this short list still does not contain indicators related to this uh, Sustainable Development Goal 16. Then it will be challenges to explore the contribution that the geospatial community can provide regarding these topics. Thank you very much for your time, and I wish you a very productive session. Thank you. Bye-bye. A number of important points uh, in there, uh, both about the, geos the global statistical framework but also about the value of this data uh, in helping us to be able to compare to other data, to organize it, um, and to be able to draw from multiple sources, including uh, crowdsourcing, et cetera. So uh, we're going to jump right in now to presentations. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm very happy to welcome Anne Severine Fabre from the Small Arms Survey. She's a data expert. And um, she's going to be discussing uh, SDG 16.4. Um, a little bit on uh, arms flows, but also on unplanned explosions. Um, and so I'll be sharing the screen now, but Anne Severine, um, welcome. Uh, just introduce yourself uh, very quickly. And then uh, while you're doing that, I will uh, start the sharing of the screen. Okay. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everybody. 
Um, I'd like first to thank the organizer for having us uh, today, and especially GRIEF, the consortium we're part of, and GeoCensus. Um, I'm answering Fab, data expert at the Small Arms Survey. And today I'm going to talk about geocoded data related to unplanned explosions at munition, at munition sites, also known as YAMS. Next slide, please. So, next slide, please. So briefly, um, before diving into the subject directly, just quickly, uh, the Small Arms Survey. So um, uh, the Small Arms Survey is a research center. We're located in Geneva and provide expertise on all aspects of small arms and on violence since now more than 20 years. We have five global databases that all relate to SDG 16 and specifically target 16.1 on violence and related death and 16.4 on illicit arms flows. So let me briefly say um, two words on GVD, uh, the Global Violent Death Database. Um, it's a database on lethal violence, uh, homicides, um, conflict death and legal intervention death. And it is considered as the global lower bound estimates of violent death in the grieved uh, consortium. We also have another database that includes data on casualties and that we're going to talk about today, which is the YAMS database. But before talking to this, let me briefly say also that we have um, the Global Farms Holdings, so on civilian, military, mm -hmm. and law enforcement holdings, and we're looking at um, uh, the different type um, place and um, that um, that uh, people have firearms. Um, we have the peace operation data sets that is looking also at um, the loss of, um, of firearms and ammunition in peace operation setting. And we have also the small arms trade transparency. So let me go directly now to the YAMS. Next slide, please. So um, what is or what are YAMS? So those are accidental explosions of abandoned, damaged, improperly stored, or properly stored stockpiles of ammunition and explosives at munition sites. So a very important point is that it refers to a military context, be it the setting, the intent with the items, and that's the difference between, for example, um, industrial um, explosions such as um, an explosion of a firearm fa firework factory. For and we've recorded more than 623 incidents in at least 106 countries and territories between 1979 and December 2019. So what does this number tell us? They tell us that the yams are a global problem. They occur in multiple countries and territories. Our YAMs are significant safety concerns for government and major security challenge because there can be casualties and you can see it in the graph, on the graph. So casualties meaning death and injuries. There can be long-term socioeconomic impacts as well as environmental costs and so on. And it also tells us that YAMs is a reminder of the importance of following international standards related to ammunition management. And especially now in the COVID-19 crisis, there's a need to be even more careful as there may be less attention given to ammunition management, while for example, dealing with uh, a shortage in staff capacity. It also tells us that YAMS can be seen as a proxy indicator for SDG target 16.4 on illicit arms flows. And why? Because it can be an indicator on state capacity to manage their stockpiles of ammunition. And this is specifically um, shown with the ratio of casualties per incident, which can show vulnerabilities. So it can say a lot on the standards when, for example, there are multiple victims. Next slide, please. If we go now directly on the link between YAMS and geocoded data, that we need to disaggregate data to leave no one behind. And so what type of geographic information do we have in the YAMS database? We have the world region, the country, and the location. When I talk about the location, it means the city, town, village, district, or department, depending on different country. And in about a dozen of cases, 
we do not have the location. We just have country level information. I will come back on that. Most of our data come from open source. So media, um, website, uh, social media as well, or written media. And um, we also use our network to complete uh, the information. So this is, we also have a part of closed source information. So now I wanted to show you, just to talk about two examples. One is the explosion in Lagos in 2002. This is the deadliest incident that we have in the database with uh, 1,500 deaths and 5,000 people injured. So there's a high number of casualties because the ammunition depot was located in the vicinity of a residential area. So here we have the information of the location. We know it's Lagos. As for the second example, we just know that there was an explosion that happened at the munition site in Russia, that there were no casualties, and that this was in a remote area, but we do not have any information more precise on the location. We just know the country level. So here we have also the challenges of the difference between a remote isolated area versus a populated area. And you know, now also, it's also linked with as well as time, because a lot of information, especially on, on social media or from news articles, come also from the people. So people now have smartphones, they can, they, can they can record the incident. Um, people can use also the word of mouth to talk about the incident. But when it's in a remote isolated area, and for example, it's in the past when maybe social media or a smartphone were less common, or in places where they are less common, we have less information about it. Also, the specific location can be seen as a sensitive, sensitive data. It can be seen as um, military intelligence data of knowing where exactly the munition site was. Maybe it's linked also to a military base. So that's why it can be seen as sensitive. But we can see that having geocoded information can help us to have opportunities for integrated analysis. So we are also looking at um, IDs incident, um, improved explosive devices or incident. And so we're trying to look at those and we may also be able to link them with, with YAMS because this is also, we also have geocoded data. So we can also interconnect or try to look at different aspects when we do have the location. So um, that's what I wanted to say. And I wanted to say that, so we have also some uncertainties of space but some ways to find, to find uh, information about it with knowledge of the inhabitants, for example, through uh, social media, for example. And this is gonna be linked with uh, what my colleague is going to present now. That's all for me. I hope I stay in the time frame. Thank you. Thank you, Anne and Severin. Indeed, uh, you were right on time. Thank you very much. Um, I think too, uh, a, a number of uh, great points there, but two that we'll definitely draw on later and bring back into the conversation. One about um, proxy indicators. Um, when we're talking about security, justice, and peace building, um, it's really valuable to have uh, oftentimes other indicators that tell us uh, for these very abstract concepts um, some, some specifics and are able to ground it. Um, and then I think also this challenge of the precision of location um, which is increasingly being solved by social media or crowdsourcing. Indeed, that's a, that's a perfect segue into talking to Javier. So um, I'm gonna turn now to Javier Andres Carranza Torres. He's the director of GeoCensos. And uh, Javier, um, while I'm getting the next slide ready, maybe you wanna introduce yourself and welcome. Oh, you'll need to unmute yourself there. Yes, sorry. Thank sorry. you very much for introducing me. And thank you very much for, for Greb and also for Cipri and all the other stakeholders that are, that are opening up to include this kind of analysis and topics into uh, their own work. I do come from the civil society side. Our organization is much more oriented to crowdsourcing kind of exercises. And I will explain one of that kind right now. My, my own perception, if we go through the first slide, I would like to introduce the program called Map for Census. 
uh, this is mostly the case of those uh, situations where serendipity arises. That is to say, we run an exercise about showing the possibility of using open data and using open source platforms for the preparation of the census in El Salvador. Uh, what we did is to build some kind of partnership with the national statistical offices and also with some civil society groups so that we could all share the possibility of involving the technologies that were coming from the open source open street map platform together with those techniques that were used for the census in uh, cartographies that is to say census cartography that were going to be used for census but out of the surprise the serendipity of of the matter we found that uh, interesting findings about this but let me in the next slide show you um, a scheme about how did we plan this action. What, what we did is to diagnose generally what we were going to do in the field, what we were going to, to face with people. We, we planned that so that we could cover the territory as well. After that, we ran uh, some interviews and also training to, to the stakeholders that were, were involved. Maybe maybe the previous slide, that one. okay, thanks. Uh, after that, what, what we, we did together with the information we got out of the interviews is that we organized what is called a mapathon. That is to say, when we trade people, we, we make them understand, we make them access to the use of these platforms that are open source. One of those is called OpenStreetMap, as I said before. And right there, we dive into the mapathon. The mapathon is, an, is, a, is a general exercise where people go to the field and they find things. And they use these techniques that are basically uh, geospatial tools that are uh, meant to be used as open data and also as open source through the, through the applications. And people go with their smartphone to the field and they, they set the, the geocoding or the, let's say the coordinates of what they find and they make their own observations. And we choose a couple of indicators. It's not the case to mention them that, but it's basically related to buildings and other constructions. And after that, what we run is, is an evaluation report where we, we, we collected all the findings. In the next slide, if you please go through it, what we, we try to represent is the flow of the different activities that we, we perform. What we first did is to raise all questions related to expectations of use of software and, and, and also uh, uh, the open data use in the territory and how to make the integration of this to the national statistics. Uh, the, the, the ones that were invited to this session were not only those that were officers in the cartography census department of the National Statistical Office, but also to small civic society groups that were involved in technologies. We applied what it is called the ADITS uh, methodology, which start by the asking questions to the people and then discussing among groups. With this input, we went to the next uh, picture that you see uh, at the top of, of this slide that went through the discussion of people trying to find conclusions about how did they compare the data they could produce with these open source and open data uh, kind of platforms towards the, the statistics that, that are used. And this is uh, really important regarding what Mr. Ocampo, I appreciate, presented before, because this is framed within the, um, let's say, global statistical geographical uh, geospatial framework, which he explained, but in that part where, where the, the muting was within, he was explaining that there were five layers that we have to go through a pyramid, which, which the first one is geoinfrastructure, infrastructure, and, and, and the second one is about exactly what, what uh, Man Severin was talking about, that's geocoding. That's kind of the hinge that statistics might, might perform together with it. So that's what we did with the, with the group, how 
we ask ourselves, how do we hinge, how would you make, integrate the statistics with the new geospatial open data? And if possible, and which would be the criteria and the standard that should be applied there. After that, what we did is an evaluation in, in, the, in the first picture on your, on your right side, uh, in the lower part of, of the slide, what we did is a comparison of the weaknesses and strengths of the, of the methodology of the open data, trying to involve, let's say, the old timers, mappers from the statistical office, and also the civil society that is more involved and knows more like new tools to do that. And the current sourcing basically was done with this tool that you see in the middle of, of the bottom side of the slide that is called field papers. Field papers is basically a tool that will that would take your geocoding, your, your coordinate where, where you, 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 are, you are checking on the map, in this case, the one from OpenStreetMap. And then you can, um, you can run a quadricule or a matrix where you have uh, four, four quadrants, but you can do more and you can analyze those. So after that, what we did is to go to the field and there is when we fight the serendipity. If you see in, in, the, um, in the, let's say, right hand side of, of, the, of the slide at the bottom, you see a street called Nine Calle Oriente and then Calle Concepcion. But in the middle of that, there was, um, there was a railroad track. And right there, we found a slump. So what I would like to share with you are the conclusions we found when we went to the territory to, to, to collect the data there and what did the mappers find, these open data mappers together with the official statistic mappers. Let's go to the next slide and, and, and I'll explain you more. Uh, well, in the next slide, what we can see are some of the, of the caveats or the concluding things that we find on the territory. Basically, we find there at, at the railroads a slum where there was a gang properly, what they call usually maras in, in the territory of El Salvador. And we were accompanied by a social service that provided that kind of linkage with local communities. In this case, it was a little bit more more dangerous or more aware for us to do this kind of exercise. But by serendipity, we found that these slum inhabitants, when we approached them and we tried to find a dialogue through this, this social security service, it was that even the armed groups were interested in the need of being mapped, not necessarily because of being mapped as, as a, a unit there, but also to be mapped because of the availability of public services. I don't know how I'm going on time. Am I on time or I trespass? I'm okay? A little bit past, but we'll take your uh, Magnus's okay. time and you, you can wrap up here. Thank you. So generally speaking, uh, and, and thank you for the wrapping up suggestion, what, what we found, it is really possible to find common places with the local communities if you find the proper arrangement via positive relationship. This is really important for when you map and when you, carto you make cartographies out of conflictive areas. You have to find arrangements. Of course, it's not for every case, but this is a case that could be working just because chance, but with a really important conclusion that people would like to be in the map, even if they are stigmatized, but any kind of conflictive relationship, they would like to be in the map. And I think that we should, everyone, everyone should be in the map so that we could build their data revolution through the SDGs and also to make this of a better world. I think I'm done. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Javier. Uh, I think that's a fantastic uh, intervention. Um, I think, you know, first of all, making those maps accessible, um, we've seen that over and over again, how important it is that people see themselves and they see this data on maps uh, to be able to understand security, justice, and peace. Um, but then also a really great reflection on the value of map making as a possibly as a, as a peace building um, intervention. Mm -hmm. Um, we can get back to that in the discussion when, when we come back later, too. Um, so I'm going to turn now to Catherine. Catherine Aguirre-Tobon is the senior researcher at Igarape, 
And um, Catherine, could you introduce yourself uh, and what Igarape is while I uh, share the screen here? Thank you, Gary. I am Caterina Aguirre from Igarape Institute, which is a research organization based in Brazil, Rio de Janeiro. But I am Colombian and based in Colombia, which shows like the nature of the organization that has a Latin American perspective, a, a comparative perspective. Uh, we have a broad agenda that is touching now complex issues of development. We started like before on only security issues, but now as the world is getting more complex, we are getting into topics such as climate change, migration, and pandemic, which is not a topic that it matters for everyone. So thank you, Gary. Thank you for allowing me, allowing me to be here in this amazing group. Uh, for me, it's, it's just a learning process. Um, I am going to talk about the basic indicator, which is homicide. And I am going to, uh, following the presentation we have seen, I am going to uh, say that homicide is not as disaggregated that we wanted to have, even if it's the basic indicator. If you continue, we use homicide because it's the indicator we consider most standardized and more complete across countries. But what I'm going to show you here is that even if there is a high level of standardization at the level of concept and at the level of methodology to get the information, there are many challenges. Of course, many of those challenges could be solved with disaggregated data, but we are haven't been able to reach to that point to be able to solve this problem with disaggregated data. Then I am going to show you some of the practical uh, um, uh, events, some of the practical facts of these challenges uh, over our homicide monitor map, which is a platform developed by Carape Institute from 2015 that is not updated with data for Latin America for the latest year. Uh, so starting with the challenges, I am going to focus on two. If you continue, Gary. This is the main one that we are facing in the group, uh, in the group that we, in the, in the consortium we are talking here, which is the overlaps. We have several manifestations of violence and several databases mapping these types of violence. We have homicide, but in conflict settings, in terrorism settings, we are not able to distinguish what is the nature of violence. And we can solve this with disaggregated data. But as I told you, and this is happening in fragile countries, the, uh, the capability to have this distinction will be more limited. And also there is overlap, as is in the, in the last line, with other forms of violence, such as unintentional violence, suicides, accidents, and for example, disappearances that could be in this information. Then going to the Latin American case, the case we have identified that is the more challenging now, is the inclusion or not of police and military killings. We have identified that the most of the countries, uh, law enforcement uh, killings are included in the homicide information. And we can distinguish this in, in the variable of cause, where we have interpersonal violence, domestic violence. And in some of the cases, you have a, a deaths in confrontations with law enforcement. But this is not regular. And this is not the same for all these countries in Latin America. We have two main cases that has a lot of problems that are Venezuela and Brazil that I am going to talk in more detail later. Going aside from the conceptual part, uh, some of the main challenges on the data collection and analysis is the existence of several sources. One country has at least two sources of information, health system and criminal justice. And if you choose one or another, it changes a lot the number, and it has consequences, for example, for the generation of aggregations, regional aggregations and global aggregations, and for example, on the rankings. And I am going to show you later one of the cases that are key, for example, in Latin America on this distinction. And the other one is the very differentiated data availability. Even if we want to get the disaggregated data, the disaggregated data doesn't exist. I am talking about public information, but also information that we request to the sources. For the Latin American case, in the homicide monitor case, we have requested the information for all the countries in the region. And we got four countries that only provide one number at the national level, that are Nicaragua, Belize, Bolivia, and Uruguay. 
even if the list is improving. And here I want to highlight that the countries that are more violent are improving a lot of the information. But for example, in the South Com and in the Albanian countries, when violence is not the big topic, the information is kind of weak. There are 11 countries with full municipality data and some possibilities to get georeferenciated data if we go deeper in the, in the, in the um, relationship with the source. They could be El Salvador, they could be Colombia, for example. And there are other cases when we have information for some cities, such as Peru and Venezuela. Regarding this situation of requesting data, for example, we have a lot of experience in Igarapé, requesting information for each of the 27 states in Brazil, where we have to request information and we got, for example, event level information for such states, such as Para. So, uh, if you allow me, Gary, uh, I'll continue, for example, uh, to the next slide, that there are the opportunities. Here, I just want to highlight that in the experience we have, the information is improving a lot in the five years. And for example, it's improving in Central America by the support of international multilateral agencies, uh, such as the UNDP and USAID, for example, that is putting a lot of resources to improve national and local observatories in Central America. So if you allow Bigari to go to the homicide monitor, I am going to illustrate some cases. Uh, the homicide monitor then is this platform that I inviting you to check is homicide.igarape.org.br. Uh, we have information from the global, uh, from UNODC 2019, and, and uh, information for Latin America updated to the latest year. So illustrating, going please to Mexico. Here we use the a criminal justice source and we have this number, 34,000. If we use the public health information, it has 2,000 more deaths, uh, 2,000 more deaths. So it changes a lot the trends and it changes a lot the rankings. So this is one topic that we need to consider for all the cases. For example, go, Gary, if you allow me to Venezuela. In Venezuela, if we consider only homicidio doloso, we have 6,000 homicides. But Venezuela also have police killing information. And it's the same number, it's almost the same number of homicides, 6,000 deaths by the police. If we go, for example, to the case of Rio de Janeiro, that has been considered the police that is killing more people in the in the world we change complete the narrative when we consider only homicide or we consider police killings for example if we consider only homicide in relation with last year we can say that violence reduced in 50 percent but if we add if we if we do the parallel we can see that police killings increase in 30 percent so this is the need to consider the challenges to consider this complexity of information that I am showing here in these cases. So thank you. I invited you to con continue playing with the platform. And there is my contact information in the last slide. And I am sure you are going also to have the opportunity to share it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Catherine. I will show that slide in just a moment so that people can get the contact information. And this will also be uh, on the recording when we put it live. Okay. Uh, so Magnus, uh, as I said, was unable to join us. But, um, here we have a brief reflection upon about the challenges of trying to disaggregate conflict data. Um, we're able, as you can see from Uppsala and other um, event coders like ACLED and the Global Terrorism Database, we're able to see the number, and this is similar to the data we just saw from Igarape in the, uh, for Brazil, Venezuela, and Mexico. We're able to see the number, for example, here of, uh, of uh, deaths in a particular geographical area uh, for a particular time period, in this case, 1989 to 2019 for Uganda. Now, the challenge with some of this conflict data is that um, you're able to zoom in so long as it's been geocoded. Um, and th this goes back to some of the challenges that Anne Severine were talking, was talking about earlier with unexploded ordnance or uh, um, unplanned explosions. Um, but also that Javier was talking about. A lot of these events are going to be reported through media. And 
frequently, uh, the media will just report uh, that a conflict event happened near a place or the, within a province or some other kind of political terrain, political uh, uh, area. And so you start to get down as you zoom into where exactly these conflict events have happened, you start to get down to levels of precision that are being lost uh, because of the types of sources that are being used for coding this. Um, and so uh, there is a lot of data here and you can access this all, th for example, through the Uppsala Conflict Data Program. I think here there was also some discussion about the Lord's Resistance Army and the move up into South Sudan out of Uganda uh, over time. Uh, so this is data that transcends the, the country border. Um, but we still have uh, some challenges. Um, so there's a lot of values. Um, you have to geocode and you have to temporally code if you're going to be reconciling data across multiple sources. Um, and this type of geocoding allows us to be able to reflect the types of violence, actors, issues, etc. But there are challenges. Uh, there's course reporting, as we just talked about, um, and often those local statistics are limited. And this is really, I think, where one of the challenges of event coding, of violent death coding, and death coding um, is hard to reconcile with the lived experience. So um, as Javier was talking about with the crowdsourcing challenges, people really value being reflected in data, seeing themselves in data, seeing how they are connected to the data. And here, um, as we start to lose some of that precision and we have this kind of very coarse reporting, we end up seeing um, a disconnect where people say, well, yeah, I know there were these conflict events, but they don't necessarily know um, they don't necessarily see themselves in it because those conflict events end up saying at the country level or they end up being um, aggregated up. Um, and so there is a lot of potential here with geospatial and geocoded data to improve that level of precision, but also improve the level of accessibility, improve the level of representation um, for, for example, vulnerable and disenfranchised groups to see themselves in the data and to see how important um, security and justice data can be for their everyday lives. So um, I just thought it was important to take a moment to reflect on these things. We didn't want to lose uh, this valuable information. Um, and I'm sure we didn't do it justice with Magnus uh, not being able to join us here. Um, Caroline, did you want to add anything else on this? Caroline Delgado is our senior researcher at CIPRI. She's also part of uh, Grieved. And she's been working on Colombia with some of the similar challenges. Maybe you want to add one or two other reflections uh, that are linked to this, Caroline. Yeah, thanks, Gary. Um, as Gary mentioned, uh, what we're doing also with the registry is, is trying to integrate data sets and uh, looking at these issues, we come across some of these um, problems that uh, has been reflected in the workshop today and, and uh, just now by Gary um, looking at Magnus' uh, slides. And we've looked at some of these cross-validation issues by zooming in on Colombia one year and trying to integrate three different data sets. And this really throws up how, how difficult it is to, to work with different data sets, depending on how they code, how they record, what is a unique event and what is not. So maybe just to, to reiterate there the, the importance of using also geocoded data to try to to separate events and, and to identify which are might be the same and which might be be different. Thanks. Yeah, we've, we really um, have been stressing within the consortium the value of geocoding and temporally coding to be able to line up so that you're cross validating across multiple sources and we can identify unique events and distinguish uh, where uh, and, and ensure that we're not double counting. And uh, next, we want to turn to Rosemary. Uh, Rosemary uh, Okello Olale is the director of the Africa Media Hub at Strathmore University. And she's been doing a lot of work on satellite imagery and uh, geocoding. And Rosemary, we want to turn to you now and get your reflections um, from your work uh, and link this to some of the work we've been doing. So could you introduce yourself? And then uh, while you're doing that, I'll start uh, sharing the screen. Good morning, uh, good afternoon and good evening. And uh, it's at night also in other parts of the world. I'm so excited to be part of this uh, 
discussion and it's really giving me a new insights and, and also learning from one another from other parts of the world how geospatial information is giving new life and giving new meaning and also making a reality on um, uh, global uh, SDG um, uh, goal 16. And for me, uh, coming from Strathmore University in Kenya, we've been able to actually experiment how geospatial information can actually empower the communities, but also can create what we call uh, truth grounding and also citizen data to be able to appreciate geospatial information. So I'll give an example on how data cubes, uh, regional data cubes used by various five countries in Africa was able to actually showcase, uh, uh, be used within the food security, um, weather patterns, and also soil composition in, in the regions. Next slide. So as we all know, uh, I'm going, I want to showcase how using Africa data cubes in Africa has actually impacted in areas which used to be seen as uh, conflict uh, zone areas. Climate change actually influences the risk of violence and we've witnessed it in uh, some other northern parts of Kenya where community fights one another without realizing why, because of um, a kind of uh, reduced um, grazing grass, but also weather patterns. These factors dominated the scenes in most rural areas and they've been vulnerable to weather changes, which they didn't know until actually we started building the capacity at the ground level. And this condition forced them to actually migrate and uh, um, kind of um, take over other people's pasture land and greener pastures in the neighboring countries, also the neighboring communities. And they, the more actually dominant communities were able to actually use their greener pastures in various areas. At the same time, other significant casual factors such as small scale conflict um, kind of arose and uh, people vulnerable community like even the women, the children were always affected and little attention was paid between the connectivity between the conflict and the climate change and understanding the relationship, even the uh, decision makers were not able to use it and uh, bring out what we call holistic policy approach in addressing the problem. Communities on the other hand, were once they were exposed, they were kept on saying, they kept on accusing each other, the tribal conflict, the regional conflict and the country conflict emerged like Kenya, Uganda, the bordering conflicts has always been something that we've been witnessing. And the risk factor has always been that it has always been addressed from the community level without looking at the national level. Next slide. So when uh, the regional Af um, Africa, Africa Regional Data Cube was introduced in Kenya 217 by the NASA and also the Global Partnership on Sustainable and Data, it actually targeted five, can five countries as um, experimental. It allowed the analysis ready satellites, e.g. the Landsat, Sentinel, to be specially and temporarily aligned in the cubes of pixels. And these data cubes hosted in the cloud allowed efficient time series analysis. And I was actually honored to be one of the person to be approached by NASA to host this within our Strathmore, working with, uh, with, um, with actually working with various organizations to host it. And um, the, in addition, the Odyssey community allowed engagement of other global users to develop new core codes, share algorithm, and provide support. So as Strathmore, we were very lucky to start training, especially the various government leadership from the top leadership, like the presidential office in Kenya, allowed the de deputy president's office to be part of the training people. And whether meteorological department in Kenya, in Sierra Leone, also the vice president's office was able to be part of the people who were able to train. That showed how they put actually the significant and the seriousness on the effective of the data cubes on how they're going to use it to understand the crop distribution, changing season, as well as agriculture land in rural areas, and also to better protect the forest. And I'll showcase, I'll show you area how in Kenya, the Mao forests were able to use it uh, to be able to understand how the patterns 
has been actually affecting the region. Vast quantities of various leadership, especially available satellite data, offer real opportunity to be improving the food patterns. And I'll show you later how communities have been able to understand it. Next. So, as I said earlier on, um, the, how the cubes were used to understand the forest patterns. As you can see, since 1980s up to 2010, the uh, deforestation has been actually increasing in an area called Mao Forest, which is the largest forest area covering almost half a million hectares. And this area has been like the water zone of the country many times, and has created a lot of conflict. And the nearby uh, communities also have been affected like the inhabitants and the coming of the Maasai and the Kipsigis, that's the tribe here. And one of the things also, it has not only created conflict, but also crises like uh, flash flooding among others. And uh, they didn't understand why, because the community themselves knew actual deforestation of certain trees was the causing. Nobody actually paid attention to them. While the government will come with their own policy, they are able to just say, let's actually plant more trees. And the community elders say, listen to us so that you can work together to make afforestation and you understand the weather patterns. On the other hand, they didn't understand, especially using the pixels, how these weather patterns have been able to actually digress from since the deforestation started in the 1980s up to now. So the, AD, the ADRC helped the stakeholders to get access to free time series of earth observation and data information for decision making. And Strathmore created more layers also that were being used to actually interact to support local decision makers at the local level in business planning, sectoral and innovation patterns, and also innovation pathways and policy measures for the last what we call five years to 10 years. And it was amazing to see how community elders leadership um, decision makers came together to be able to understand this. And actually it has created what we call a new approach, a new way of actually looking at afforestation in that area. Next slide. So the understanding from the Mao help us to see uh, when we're training initially, I told you we trained the various leadership in Kenya and other five countries, which is Tanzania, Senegal, Sierra Leone and Ghana. And community leaders also came and also civil society. And one of those civil society people who came up represented from what we call Horn of Africa for Development Initiative in Isiolo, where there has to be an increase on uh, uh, small scale conflict, especially when it comes to um, grass, uh, greener grass pastures for communities. So we are able to train them to understand the nexus between the climate change conflict for, or for, for conflict within the borders. And this actually existed within these regions, um, namely Mwingi County, Garissa County, Tukana County, West Pokot, and also Karamajong in, uh, in, in Uganda. As well as also, they were able to understand how what they do causes actually limitation of access to greener pastures. Because within the pixels, we are able to showcase how the whether patterns, the soil composition and the soil fertilization is able to make sure that they don't get the kind of right pastures they need. So this, um, as I said earlier, the conflict has been something that is a regular pattern until a decade ago, when actually we ventured um, uh, without, with the, with in, in Isiolo. And being part of the stakeholders within the workshop at ERA ADRC, uh, those who attended went back and simplify the information on how we're able to analyze the data for them. As you are, within the previous discussion, geospatial information help us to actually analyze this information in a language that they're able to understand. And we translate it in the local language and they sat themselves in communities and saying, what can we do as a community? So they were able to ask, how can they address the status quo and the problems they are facing to reduce, especially livelihood based on land they use and the small scale farming and how they can be able to enhance so that they don't have conflicts all the time. How can they address livestock production, which is their major source of income and also interactively face the challenges. And the community leaders 
help the community leadership to introduce what we call policies at the community and stewardship level. And these structures, they were able to use it to kind of correlate and interact and, and make ground truthing to be able to be appreciated at the national level. Next slide. So as I said earlier, the empowering uh, how the Africa Real Data Keeps manage uh, help us to empower the community. And this is how they were able to actually bring themselves in Isiolo. There were 155 villages, they came together and these were able to have various groups, women and the youth, and to meet, meet and discuss the various challenges they are facing in the region. And downloading this information, they are able to showcase how the weather, weather patterns have been able to be interactive since actually because the geospatial data that we had was more or less 20 years. From 20 years up to now, how the weather patterns had been able to actually change and how this information they are translating their local level. From there, they're able to actually come back with the best practices, which they say they could use to address the challenges and provide all opportunities to discuss. Alternatively, also, there were the news people who came to be able to use it to actually tell stories, how the villagers are able to use this information to address the weather challenges. And it has seen these communities now start to looking at livestock in a different way. They're even able to grow it for export. They're even able to make the area become actually agriculture prone area. And like the, before, that was only focusing on livestock. They're able to showcase actually what kind of crop patterns they're able to produce. And they're producing other, pro um, other products which is making it become actually food secure as opposed to what it was before. So for us, we are seeing actually the Africa regional data cubes because of that geospatial information, which is open data, translating a local language is able to showcase the connectivity between policymakers, um, communities, and how these techies, uh, we also the techies, be able to come and uh, use this information to empower the communities, the most vulnerable, such that they can also be take part in development and make development become a reality at their local level. And uh, that's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much, Rosemary. Uh, that's a really fascinating and it's, it's interesting to see uh, the peace building that's happening there. Um, I think we'll just segue straight into a, a brief conversation. We have about 15 minutes left. Um, and so I think that your last point there raises a really interesting question. It ties back to what Javier had brought up earlier too. Um, and then we'll, uh, I'll, I'll give this question to you, both of you, but then we'll open up the floor. So look forward to everybody else's um, intervention. Um, I'll just move this to the last slide. There's contact information for Rosemary and uh, now a discussion. Um, but the question I think that that raises is, uh, there's another value there that I, I hear you saying, um, and I wonder to the degree to which this has been um, studied or reflected or captured, which is the value of using geocoded data to get to the common understanding of an issue that ends up reducing conflict. So in this particular case, you can imagine that those 155 villages, each one of them was experiencing climate change or desertification or other uh, environmental pressures. And each one of them thought, well, this is happening to us, right? Uh, but in the course of now using the data cubes and having a common understanding with satellite imagery, this is happening broadly to the region. And this is how everyone is impacted by this. Um, that then you could see them starting to come up with solutions that transcend individual village experience, right? Um, and so uh, it would be great to have you reflect a little bit on that. And then we'll turn to Javier. Um, and I think you hear a similar kind of experience happening with the crowdsourcing and the kind of uh, participatory element of, of data coding. What do you think, Rosemary? Yeah. Y Yes, um, they always actually says that lack of information make people actually not know what they are doing. And uh, what uh, geocoded in uh, data was able to showcase, especially looking at the satellite imagery, 
was that the, initially the community felt that the problem was just uh, caused by the local, by the other tribes, that whenever they wanted to graze land, they could come and uh, throw them out. They didn't link it to the climate change. And they're always saying that the season, they knew the season where the fighting could take place. So it was like a, a merry-go-round kind of fighting. And they're saying the stronger the community, they, and so the, you find the community having what we call warriors. And within the Maasai, they are the warriors fighting. So they trained the communities to be stronger than the others so that they could actually showcase their, strong, their strength when they're capturing the grazing uh, land. But showing them that, look, this is how it happens that even if you fight here, this uh, grass is going to actually come to an end and the other grass is going to grow. Why don't you understand the problem using the climate change information with the satellite imagery as it comes from since the last 20 years? Because they are wondering, oh, the last 20 years, our elders never fought here, why are we fighting? Because of the climate change. So by using that, and yeah, analyzing into a local language they understand, plus the women who could be, are actually the key peacemakers, they're able to start discussing, look, let's not fight one another. This is what is affecting everyone. It's not only us affecting the world, how can we become part of the solution? And then the communities, like in an area, another community we went, they were experiencing uh, food insecurity. And we were saying that, um, was there food insecurity 20 years ago? Say no, I said why? Because we are growing crops that are actually relevant to the region. So the elders were saying that, listen to us, we know what is better for us. And that's why we say the community elders is key to pay attention when we use citizen data and are combining it with geocoded data to be able to actually come up with local solutions. Javier, do you want to reflect on that? And then let's open up the discussion after that too, um, not just about crowdsourcing and citizen data, but also what, what are the next steps uh, for geocoding and, and how are they going to be relevant for solving some of these uh, security, justice, and peace building um, issues? So uh, Javier, first to you, and then uh, uh, maybe we'll go to some of our other uh, colleagues. Okay. Thank you. Uh, my general vision about, you know, when you get together uh, minds that are oriented to the spatial issues and minds that are oriented to specific statistics is that it depends on the spatial phenomena that we are speaking about. Uh, Mrs. Okelo Lale specified very well the relationship between conflicts and natural resources. And already that has a, a spatial nature. But when you speak about crime issues and, 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 and menaces and all those statistics that it are, are regarded on the SDG 16 side, it is much more difficult to identify not only the, not only the large scale, but also the smaller scale. Mrs. Mrs. Okelor Lale said very well, this is a small scale experiment, this is a small scale vision that could be identified because of the different towns that were involved. But when you go to a much more larger scale, then it gets more difficult. So what, what I would, would, would contribute is about the vision that probably when we are trying to geocode in this level of SDG 16, we would, should be really aware that when you go zooming in to the picture, we will need to be more general about the statistics that we are managing because they are not only difficult to get, but also really sensitive for, for revealing and to, to building up indicators. Maybe this is too obvious and probably uh, those that were in the construction and the architects of the SDGs and the general information framework, the, the, the global information framework for the SDGs already thought about, but maybe we should bring it to more to the floor, to the ground, to speak about which is the, the maximum level of scale we are, we are aiming to. Mm -hmm. And that's why we, we realize in this crowdsourcing period that you have a certain limit to, to identify specific issues. For instance, the, the, the house, the, the, black, the white houses that they call in Spanish, there were the, the spaces where you know, drugs were dealt. Those specific objects cannot be mapped, really. Mm -hmm. So you have to be really careful and really 
agreeable about what are we going to map and in which scale. So mm. I think that maybe this opens a little bit the discussion. That's a perfect segue, I think, to Catherine, uh, thinking about uh, homicide mapping, in, in particularly in Latin America. Yes, I wanted to add on this challenge of the lower bond in Latin America. And I, I know all across the world, there are a lot of platforms of, to, to make denounces about crimes. So it will be an interesting uh, area of, of, of alternative data. But of course, we will have the challenge that these are reports to the criminal justice and public health system. So that will be, we will have a lot of limitations. But I want to highlight, for example, one case. In Venezuela, you could expect it's a country where information is not available. This information I was, I was talking about in the presentation is just one national number. But for example, uh, civil societies don't agree with this number. Of course, they say it is underestimated by a lot of, a lot of uh, proportion. But I want to, for, for example, to tell you that, for example, in Caracas, there are some experiences from a thing called Caracas Me Convive and from Reacin, where they are trying to develop an indicator, a database, the tele database, by going to the morgues. How do you say it in Spanish, eh, Javier? Morgues? 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 The slaughterhouse. Yes. <laughs> they go, okay, they, they take a thing, a very heavy, very difficult work, but mm -hmm. they are located in the morgues, in the main morgue of, 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 of Caracas, and they are taking the information directly and they are also developing more information about the victim, contacting the families. Mm -hmm. So in these cases, for example, in Latin America, in Caracas, that is a city that we expect could have the highest rate, uh, maybe in the world now, uh, mm -hmm. they are developing these ways to, to access this information when no information is available for criminal justice and public health data. And Severine. And jumping on, on what Catherine said, indeed, so now more and more we're trying to develop, like we were talking about proxy indicator, we should talk about maybe also alternative sources than the typical sources that we use to go to. So for example, like talking about um, homicides, the, the typical sources used to be criminal justice and public health, but like Catherine showed new, new alternative, new ideas now are, are coming to, to try to, to fill the gap, the gap that those, um, different sources cannot keep. And like we're saying, like in crime, there's always also that um, like that, that figure, like the, the, the number that, it, that is unknown. So that's why now we're developing more alternative to try to find that number. And that, that may be also um, the same with, but, well, for, for the unplanned explosion admission site, it's a bit different because it's, it's a different structure as well. So it's, it's hard also to, to, to highlight um, to identify um, alternative sources, but in a way, um, it relates also maybe to what Ravia was saying about um, uh, being able to locate the slums and to be able, for example, to have access to public service. Like for example, when you think about the um, ammunition management and where uh, there should be a munition site depot or ammunition depot or munition site, you have to think also about that. You have to think about you have to have an idea about the space. What is close? Is it, is it in a residential area? Is it out of a residential area? You have to think about the what if and the worst case scenario. Like for example, we, we saw with, with the example of Lagos, but there are also other examples where it was in, in residential or populated area. And we see that the number of casualties were higher. We have also like two weeks ago, there was um, um, an explosion of an ammunition depot site in, uh, Russia and Ryazan, and as well, they had to, um, then the villagers had to leave. So they have to accommodate also the, those villages. So you have to think about, you have to have a great idea of the space. Where is it close to? What could happen? What if there is a blast? What would be the, you know, the kilometer or the meter of the blast? Because when you think about um, those kind of explosion, often people think that it's just one explosion. But the thing is that you have one explosion, then you have also the other ordnance that, that are also explosive that can explode, but further. So you have to think about all these, these parameters when you're thinking about this. So you have to have a great deal of idea of the space and where to locate and the specificity around it. So that's a comment. Thanks. 
Um, I think I'm going to wrap it up unless there are any last interventions. I'm just reflecting on this conversation. It's been um, really, really interesting. Um, I think that there's a lot of expertise that's exhibited here, but it also shows the state of the art and the knowledge right now. Um, we see, uh, I think for many years, when you think about going up to the SDG process, people were saying, we can't measure peace building, we can't measure justice, but it's very evident. There's Here's uh, five examples uh, where this is being measured and it's actually having real impacts on the ground. Um, not just because it's affecting policy, as we've just seen examples uh, with with unplanned explosions, but also with um, agricultural and planning and, and planting um, and livelihoods, but also because of the way people interact with um, these statistics, the way that people see themselves in it and the real lived experience on the ground, the, the importance of being acknowledged through data. Um, and so I think these are all really good examples. It's an ongoing conversation. We're all gonna be working on this for many years uh, to come, I think, um, but, and, and there's lots of work to be done, but it's also clearly a ripe area for, for work uh, because we see this framework of geocoding and temporal coding, this kind of skeleton where these data cubes are very informative. They can show us stacking information on top of each other and being able to really create a, a better understanding of the, the world around us. So um, I thank everyone very much. It was a pleasure talking to all of you. Um, and I think we've had a really interesting conversation and uh, we look forward to continuing it. And thanks to GeoCensos uh, and the UN World Data Forum for having us. Uh, and we look forward to continuing the conversation in the future. Thanks everyone.